in a tent. Lawsuits. Ah, yeah, I, I've mentioned these lawsuits quite a bit on another list, but there was good reason for it, okay? Lawsuit number four in FNAF 6. Well, I mean, like, number four, at least if you go by the fandom wiki gallery order, but civil suit number 36542287 has their first complaint as, quote, a young boy suffered severe mental trauma because of the defendant Fesper Entertainment Inc.'s ice cold indifference to the health and well being of the human population, which, I mean, while true, we all know it's true, wouldn't actually be valid on a lawsuit. You, you can't describe the company as cold hearted or say that they didn't care about the health and well being of the human population. That's slander or libel, depending on how you want to pursue it. But as it would pertain to the facts of the case itself, they have no information as to what is in the brains of others. It's like how you can't use what someone else has said to you as evidence, you know, objection hearsay. But in this case, uh, it doesn't seem like Fazbear actually has fault in this incident. The ground gave way beneath the boy and he got trapped in basically a mini sinkhole, something that would have been near impossible to calculate and actually comes back to bite Fazbear Entertainment in the ass when, you know, the sinkhole happens in security breach. But it's also noted on the suit that Fazbear Entertainment lowered him pizza and party favors while they were waiting for emergency services. Okay, and, uh, come on, that's doing their part. What are they gonna do? Pull this kid out of a sinkhole? And also, all this kid ended up developing from this was a fear of the dark and a fear of anchovies, both of which I had as a kid and I'm not suing anyone. So I wanna see them explore those lawsuits like this in the movie. I wanna see William in court. Come on, put him up against Mike Ross. And at nine, the box. What's in the box? The FNAF 4 box has, like the Bite of 87, been a pain in the ass for all FNAF fans. And those who try to explain things have been struggling for a while to explain what could be inside this infamous box. However, FNAF 6 might have given us an answer that we were looking for with the simple final speech. In Henry's final speech from the true ending of the game, the layout of the FNAF 6 pizzeria is oddly similar to the layout of the FNAF 6 building. And the stories from Candy Cadet talking about five things becoming one thing and then getting put in a box makes sense with this as well. Five animatronics, however you want to count it, Baby, Scrap Baby, Molten Freddy, the puppet, Lefty, or Molten Freddy as most of them, however you want to work it, even if you include your character, five things are becoming one fire that, <laughs> yeah, they, they all go up in smoke. And that's just, that's Freddy Fazbear's pizza. While William might have escaped, um, maybe that's what the box is supposed to represent. You know, the box being the reality that William is able to escape all the time. Who knows, really? Uh, I, I don't, but you know what? Hopefully we will after this goddamn movie, because this is one of the biggest mysteries of the series, so it would be nice if you were to explain it. In, an in the Bite of 87, the survival logbook makes an appearance on yet another list, because it still makes me mad to this day. This time, either solidifying or making the Bite of 87 even more confusing. The Bite of 87 being the mysterious incident where someone, presumably Jeremy from FNAF 2, gets his frontal lobe bitten off by an animatronic. We thought that we had the animatronic who did it pinned as Mangle, but then Ultimate Custom Knight comes along and then proposed that maybe it was Toy Chica, with the voice line of Where's My Beak lodged in your forehead, of course. What the hell else could that mean? However, I think the long book actually tries to give us more of an answer as to who done did it. On page 35, the book asks you some would you rather questions about if you were trapped under a desk for a week or surrounded by baby themed animatronics. But the last question it asks you is whether you would rather lose a frontal lobe or an arm. Every other question makes sense, aside from this one, at least in that situation. But if you go to page 87, you see a couple of animatronic cage matches where you're determining the winner and why they would win. And on page 86, this happens as well, but both animatronics up for debate are in this section, but Mangle is the only one that we think could have done it that appears on page 87. And they're clearly set up to win because they're being pitted against Balloon Boy. I mean, it's a freaking fox versus a baby. How do you think that's gonna go? Cheek is also presented in this section, but she's on page 86 against Freddy, which is a much more fair matchup. Maybe this is Scott trying to correct us from what we thought we learned in Ultimate Custom Night, or maybe it's just another coincidence or a diversion, but it doesn't matter as long as they let us know who did it in the finale movie please if you omit this this key moment from the series in this movie I'm going to sue you speaking of which and seven coffee 
In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics, but one of the most interesting is probably the coolest hidden secret animatronic in the series ever. And yeah, there's secret animatronics. Coffee is actually not even an animatronic in the FNAF series. It's from another one of Scott's games, which failed, like every other game before FNAF, unfortunately, but at least FNAF was successful. So, you know, he's gonna make references. This one is one of them. The game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope, and in that game, Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of the nearby humans. It's a sentient coffee machine. That actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yog Labs. Coffee can be seen in FNAF 3 in VR if you reload the level enough times. He will at some point randomly be sitting on your desk. You can't really interact with him, and he won't actually make you coffee, um, which sucks because, you know, when I'm freaking out because a 60 year old dude is trapped in an animatronic coming after me at 2 a.m. You know, coffee's, sh I should need it because, you know, uh, it's 12 to 6 a.m. Like, all, all you need is like a shot of William getting his morning cup of joe in the movie, right? And then just have the coffee maker look like coffee from Desolate Hope, and we will all be happy. We will cheer. We will actually cheer. And it's six, the fourth child. I proposed this idea that perhaps William and his wife are baby mama, but most likely wife at this point, had four kids instead of three. That, you know, the three that we see in game. This was mostly based off The Immortal and the Restless, the TV series from Sister Location, where a woman was telling a character most assumed to, met, to be a representation of William that he had a son that clearly was his, but he was denying it. And then after looking at the genetics and then trying to explain to the people in my life who don't really understand it and pushing them all away and causing self-isolation, it just shows how likely this scenario was. If the babies came out blonde, uh, William might just have thought that they weren't his. But what if later, William realized that the baby was in fact his and wanted it back? Or perhaps, I'm wrong about the whole thing. Um, I don't know. At least, I wasn't sure until a comment from YouTube user Saber Sapphire on T Tiny Details Part 7 actually gave me a little bit of info. I think we can all agree that Ballora is an allegory for Mrs. Afton, alright? William made the robot as a way to cope. And we can also agree that she's supposed to be a mother figure to the mini Renas. And that's what got us all thinking that she was meant to be a mother in the first place, aside from her song. Well, Saber pointed out that the number of mini Renas that Ballora has is four. Okay, Ballora has four children, and if she's meant to represent the mother of the Afton kids, this detail could solidify this theory even more. And maybe that's where Vanessa comes from, alright? Explore it in the movie. Give me like some, give me some like, Jane the Virgin drama, where Afton has a fourth kid. Come on. How are we doing at number five, Secret Panther? No, no partner. How are we doing at number five, Secret Partner? Glitch Trap is an odd character, okay? They're supposed to be an accidental addition to FNAF VR, but they somehow are able to interact with the environment and alter aspects of the game. That's not an accident, okay? I've always questioned why Glitch Trap is able to move the curtain in the final scene and then put us in the Freddy suit, but how is he able to do that if he's supposed to be a spirit? Well, um, he, he can't, all right? That, that's, that's not it. And, and any being must obey the laws of the form they inhabit, or whatever it says in it, chapter 2. So, how is he able to move things like a curtain when I can't move them in game? Alright, simple. He wasn't an accident. He was a glitch, but he was, he was intentional. He's, he was meant to be there, obviously. That's why Vanny's working on getting him out, or ends up getting him out, or whatever it is. He was meant to be there, okay? Glitch Trap was an intentional feature of FNAF VR, which makes me think, who else is working for him? Because at this point, Vanny Vanny wouldn't have been possessed or under his control. So yeah, I hope they explore that in the FNAF movie, or at least like introduce a character that is clearly meant to be this mysterious third party. And a four hiding spot. I really hope this movie answers this question properly because sw I swear to the Dark Lord Cthulhu this should not have been possible. William should in no way have gotten away with putting the missing children's victims in the animatronics like we're led to believe. The smell of rotting bodies would ruin everything. The, the decomp would speed up because the animatronics are moving around. I've, I don't know how many times I've said this at this point. Okay, they're in front of people every single day. People started complaining that they were leaking blood and mucus and that they were smelling like death. It, there's no way Way that if William getting away wasn't important to the story, he wouldn't have been caught. Come on. It was also pointed out to me that Foxy has holes in his body, alright? So if there was a kid that was in there, you'd be able to see it. You'd be able to high-five little Timmy as you're walking by Foxy and he's putting on a show, but then you're like, wait a second, that's a body. 
so, yes, while originally maybe we were like led to believe that I have to put the bodies in the animatronics, it's basically impossible. So, I hope they explain what actually happened in the movie. Getting close to the end, and at number 3, 1985 keypad. The security panel code of 1985 from sister location revealing images of like the FNAF 4 house isn't a new thing. It's We've known it for ages, but, and, and many are using to this to confirm the events of this game taking place in 1985, or actually trying to confirm FNAF 4 taking place in 1985, but this begs the question, where did these rooms come from? If this confirms the events of the game taking place in 1985, why are the houses we play in during the 8-bit and then the main gameplay so different? I mean, it could be an illusion since, since we know that the animatronics are, because you know, it's a, it's a brain coma thing, but like, if that was the case, how would the cameras be seeing this? Okay, and then if these are two different houses, why? Why? What does that mean for the series overall? Like, come on. Hell, where's the parents' bedroom in the 8-bit house, okay? Is it like that locked door? But like, that is that the room? And even if it is, where's the plush trap hall? This this is one thing that's always bothered me about this game, and I know, okay? Like, of all things, this is gonna bother me? Yes. Okay, because as far as I'm concerned, FNAF 4 is a video game in their universe, so those cameras can't be legit, unless it was just meant to illustrate that they would be in the same house or something. But ultimately, in number two, explosive ending. William dies, okay, at the end of Man in Room 1280, not before that. The third story of the fifth Fazbear Frights book, and, they're, they, and he does so quite extravagantly, exploding into a pile of mush right before a pastor's eyes. But how is that possible? How could William just explode? It's not something you really think about, but I have quite the explanation because I just want it to happen. William knew about possession, and he knew how it happened. He knew that the agony required to do such a thing was excruciating, because, you know, his daughter got scooped, his son got crunched. So what if he just wanted to ensure that he would suffer extreme agony by injecting or installing some form of explosive device within him that when triggered, if, like, in the vicinity of, like, a Fazbear warehouse or something, would just boom, boom, instantly, all right? I mean, it wouldn't... It, it, would mean that he couldn't fly anywhere, but he doesn't really need to fly anywhere. He has everything he needs. So, yeah, this guy was mental, um, possibly injecting himself with a remnant, which is molten soul metal in order to stay alive. So, yeah, this isn't out of the question. So, if the movies want to get closer to where the games are, uh, with the next two movies that Matthew Lillard's contract has actually confirmed, then, I don't know, maybe we could get a security breach movie if they do this. So. Do it. I want to see. I want to see Shaggy as William Afton explode. And finally, in number one, back together. I'll put you back together. That's it. That's the number. I want this explained. Okay? Is crying child a robot? Just tell me. Tell me, please. All right. Thank you. In a 10, Golden Freddy. While I may believe that Golden Freddy is merely a hallucination that Michael sees while being possessed by his younger brother, many believe that Crying Child possesses Golden Freddy. Some even think that Crying Child and Cassidy share the animatronic, which would be impossible if Cassidy is supposed to be possessing William, and given everything we know about possession in the games, that just kind of negates the other possibility. But if you believe that Golden Freddy is a physical animatronic possessed by Crying Child, you'll find out in the movie, because if there's no physical one, then I feel like it's kind of confirmed, all right? Plus, I don't think that Crying Child would attack his brother. If we want to say that Crying Child wouldn't be angry at his father, then I don't know why we, he would be mad at his brother for, you know, assuming that an animatronic won't crush his skull, because it makes sense, and especially not after all this time, because remember, FNAF 1 takes place in 1993, 10 years after his death. And at this point, Michael would have gone through sister location, uh, so, you know, his uh, insides would be all jumbled, he would be purple, and he would also kind of have the remnant of his sister on him still, so Crying Child would be like, oh, okay, so you have suffered. <laughs> Who knows, okay? Either way, Golden Freddy is like such a weird animatronic that never really has a proper explanation. They crash us, he never gets a hold of us, we're not clearly dead because of him, so I just hope that they explain him in the movie, okay? Because it seems to be a pretty core premise of the series, so they don't explain it then I'm just gonna assume that I was right. In at nine, arrest made. One comment that's always stuck out to me was about a newspaper clipping from FNAF 1. That clipping says that the killer was convicted for the murders of the missing children, which doesn't really make sense, given that, you know, Afton's out and about in literally every other game. Unless Henry was falsely convicted, but since they couldn't find the bodies, maybe he got out of prison when Fazbear Frights happened. It explains why he wasn't involved in the first two games, to our knowledge at least, but I will say that I have heard a lot of different information and 
and ideas concerning the missing children's incident, so can't exactly be sure what's going on. But honestly, uh, Henry being falsely imprisoned for that incident would explain a lot. And considering how there are no bodies, there might not be much forensic evidence, so the case would rely on circumstantial, and it could have dragged on for a while, depending on how dedicated the state was to prosecuting him. Until 1993, when Fazbear Frights opened. Look, okay, 30 years is a long time for new information to come to light, and I originally thought that we would have to ignore that newspaper, but maybe the movie can explain what happened. Or even it just, like, starts with Henry getting arrested. And it ain't Springlock suit legality! Okay, the Springlock suits themselves are such a massive occupational hazard that Fazbear did not need to create. These things are hella deadly, and both William and Henry just allow for the employees to wear them. I get William doing it because he's a sociopath who doesn't care about anyone, but come on. Dude, Henry, you're supposed to be better. Make a separate suit for the animatronic character that's just a suit, so the employees who run your business and make you money don't end up dying from having their bones replaced with animatronic robot parts. I don't need servos in with my guts. Okay, I mean that my guts are supposed to be there. I'm sure it would be like a hell of a lot cheaper to make a suit too, instead of having all this complex machinery that you gotta crank. What's your deal here, man? Why did either of you think that was a good idea? And particularly Henry, okay? Please explain the justification behind this in the movie. I got, I gots to know. I am filming this on Desperation Day, by the way. How I met your mother joke. And it's seven hanging scientists. The sister location hanging scientists weren't there before they're revealed to us. Okay, we have lights on in those windows. Windows. They're trying to show us that Ennard is willing and able to kill anyone who gets in his way, but that also means that there were people working there while we were during Sister Location. And I don't know why they did that, since it was literally filled with deadly animatronics, and the only reason we were there was to put her back together, like William somehow asked us to do. But like, why were there others there? I thought the business was shut down. What's going on? Is it still running? Chica's Party World's still a thing? Yeah, I don't know, man, it's weird, okay? But hey, I'm not, I'm not here to judge how a fictional serial killer runs their fictional business? Actually, yes, I am. That, that's become the whole point of this channel now. Why would they have showed us these bodies if they also needed us to escape? Wouldn't we have just noped the hell out of there? I would. I don't care what my dad told me to do. If they're like, oh, hey, by the way, I've killed two people, I'm leaving. And considering how this was called the Mike screenplay when Scott was talking about it on Reddit a couple of years ago, I hope that we get the answer to this question, because it doesn't make sense to me. And it's six roaming animatronics. Okay, straight up, the whole roaming animatronics thing from FNAF 1 is such BS, and I can't even fathom why they thought that it would be required. That's not how servos work. Okay, but whatever, Fazbear Entertainment, you do you. You can deal with OSHA, especially when they're walking around and you know that they're hostile. Phone guy warns us that they might shove us into a suit if they see us because we look like a naked endoskeleton, which is already BS. Okay, and we know that because they ignore the endo in the storage room. But like, why would you make this a part of their coding? Why would you let them roam around if they're gonna try to shove me in with robot parts? Do they look at every human they see as a naked endo? And if they do, then how are people actually showing up and not leaving in body bags, okay? God, it's only the first game. Like, for f**k's sake, people. You can't just, like, try and be a normal company for once, or maybe even just, like, have, like, the slightest hint about why anyone would be cool with this, okay? Or maybe why nobody ever reported Fazbear Inc. to, like, the labor board or something, even if it's, like, just an explanation that they, they got tried to but got killed before they could. Come on, put it in the movie, please. How about we do it at number five, Brave Volunteer. I'm calling it out again, because while he might have had issues killing Afton somehow for whatever goddamn reason, Henry just seems fun fine offing his son when he gets the chance. I mean, in both of the fires that Henry set, FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, Michael was there both times. And sure, Michael might have set the FNAF 3 fire, but if Henry set the FNAF 6 one, it would make sense that he also set the FNAF 3 one. And he also didn't seem to care that Michael was in the building the first time. He also doesn't give Michael the opportunity to exit in FNAF 6, despite there having been a way out plan. Quote from the final speech in Henry's words, and to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out plan for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling you are right where you want to be. No, I'm not. I want want to live. He, he assumes that we want to die in these halls for whatever reason and he doesn't give us a chance to actually make the decision for ourselves. He just like forces us to die. It's, it's a crime. But again, he doesn't give us the option, which I would like explained in the movie. Please, explain to me how this isn't just a murder. Just the slightest crumb so I can run with it for four more years. In a four domino. During the true ending of Security Breach, or the Afton ending, the burn trap ending, whatever you want to call it, how does this 
happens so perfectly. Like there's beyond even plot armor levels of luck here, okay? We're basically Domino. It's the very easy to understand monitor setup in the room that we fall into that's connected to the cameras in various rooms that Burn Trap enters and ironically, he only enters those rooms with buttons that light the fires in the rooms that correspond to the monitor the button is in front of. Think about it, how are these working? It's been a while, it's been a long time. These cameras and old computers are still working for who knows how long after the FNAF 6 to security breach. It's been through a lot, all right? It's been through the fire that ruined the building. It's fallen into a sinkhole that opened up beneath it. It's had a whole god mall pizza plex Chuck E. Cheese fever dream built on top of it. How is all of this working after that? Get this like later in the timeline, but please have like Henry planning out the FNAF 6 location fire thing or something, okay? So I can understand how this was all so well preserved. Getting close to the end of the number three security puppet. Now, this might be a controversial topic, but in my humble opinion, if you're suspicious of your business partner and concerned for your daughter's well being and even life, you don't just give her a special bracelet then that makes her a priority to your one security robot and then leave her alone, all right? Especially when that security bot can be disabled by simply placing a couple of boxes on top of its box. You keep her home as much as you can or like keep an eye on her. Like you don't like lock her in the house, but you don't let a three year old run around next to your homicidal partner. And you should be doing that anyway. Like you should be keeping an eye on her anyway because you know, she's a three years old. You don't give her a bracelet then let her run amongst the big kids at, at a pizza place where she's locked outside and then killed. No. Okay, how did she even get locked outside? How is that possible? How could that even happen? She can't reach the doorknob for God's sakes. Neglectful. You're neglectful, okay? Henry puts a green bracelet on his three-year-old and says, yeah, that's enough. I'm good. And then neglects her, hoping that the green bracelet's going to be enough. Bro, what the hell? Especially when the man that you think is going to hurt her is the one who built the goddamn animatronics in the first place and then knows exactly how to disable them when the time comes. Think things through for once. This is also in the right time frame for the movie as well, so please, explain what Henry was thinking when he just left his daughter alone with a serial after giving a new slap bracelet. But ultimately in at number two, Scrap Trap. Also, what happened to Scrap Trap between games to cause such significant changes in his design? Sure, he was like, he was burnt in FNAF 3, kind of, but we also see him alive and well in Sister Location's ending cutscene, not damaged or barely damaged. So where did all this additional changes come from? His head gets larger, his feet get larger. I genuinely don't know how that would make any sense. Okay, we know that it's the same person. It's not someone new, thanks to Ultimate Custom Night. In a previous video, I talked about how FNAF 4 is a game made by Scott Cawthon's in-universe version, and then that would thus mean that any character appearing in Ultimate Custom Night would also be fake. I hope you get what I mean. <laughs> if you haven't, check out the video. I explained it way better there. I'm not going crazy. It makes me think that, that Springtrap is probably less than real. He's probably fake. He's faker than Glitchtrap, for of all things. And you know what? It explains the discrepancy between between Springtrap to Scraptrap and then Burn Trap, and then I just want an explanation in the movie, okay? I'm rambling. Let's move on. And finally, in number one, evil programming. Have you ever thought about why these animatronics are attacking you? Like, really? Because, like, sure, it's because we look like William and the animatronics are possessed and they're trying to get revenge or whatever, but if I was possessing something and going after the guy that I thought killed me, I'd get pretty steamed if he kept shutting a door in my face every time I got close to enacting my revenge. But if that kept happening, do you know what I would do? I wouldn't do the same thing. I would change things up. I would go down a different path. I'd break in through the back window. But nobody does that in FNAF 1. Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, they all stick to their same paths every time that they come after us, which makes me think that they aren't doing it because they want revenge, they're doing it because they have to. No, repeated patterns and inability to adapt might work with my brain, but it doesn't work with possessed animatronics. No, it's their programming. They're doing what they're told. They're following the same route every time. That's what code does. Angry spirits possessing robots would be adapting, even if they're kids. They've been possessing them long enough in 1993, so I don't know, maybe they make this a possible point of interest in the movie, Please, for God's sakes, I just want all these things explained in the movie. And it's in the purple guy animatronic. The purple guy animatronic legend is an urban legend revolving around FNAF in early 2015. A YouTube video service that reportedly showed a hidden animatronic reported 
to be the purple guy, who was at the time the only name we had for the main antagonist. The appearance of the purple animatronic was preceded by a phone ringing because we thought that he was also the phone guy. And then after the phone rang, the purple animatronic would briefly flash on screen, slumped over against the wall in the office in a similar style to Golden Freddy. However, it was soon revealed that this was simply because the animatronic was simply a photoshopped image of Golden Freddy with a purple color and Chica's head. I think that it's pretty obvious that it was photoshopped and I mean that like we've used that image in thumbnails a couple of times but no character and like this has ever showed up in any of the games. But nevertheless I'd still like to see it appear in the movie as like an easter egg or a reference okay. Same thing for in at number nine buff Helpy. This meme created by at Dominius on Twitter, Buff Helpy was made for the YouTuber Daco's FNAF meme reviews, since that was his, the primary content on his channel at the time. He made a joke in the video where he pretended to be terrified of it, and then people started sending him tons of memes about that one single image. It has since spread from there, leading to Buff Helpy even getting his own spin-off game. Yeah, he even has his own Urban Dictionary page that labels him as a traitor to his country who loves stalking the YouTuber Daco and somehow always makes it into Daco's FNAF meme reviews. Followed by the use of the term in Buff Helpy is best boy. Buff Helpy is not best boy, okay? And this entire thing was posted by a user called Buff Helpy Enthusiast. And you know what? Buff Helpy has also haunted me. I hadn't seen any of Daco's FNAF meme reviews, so luckily I was oblivious to this. However, people just started randomly sending it to me on Instagram and then it kind of scared me from there. And while it may be haunting, at least a mention of it in the movie would be very much appreciated, like how Sanic was referenced in the Sonic movie. And it ain't Chucky. Now, while not canon in the FNAF universe, there is certainly no doubt that Chucky e. Cheeses was the inspiration for the FNAF series. And while yes, the comments about Chipper and Son's Lumberco characters looking like robots pushed Scott towards the idea, we've made a whole video about how FNAF and Chuck E. Cheese are the same thing. So, getting a Chuck E. Cheese reference or Easter egg in the movie would be absolutely amazing. Even if it's someone just like proposing or pitching a new character that just so happens to look a hell of a lot like Chucky, that's good enough for me. There just needs to be some form of reference to it. Or, if you're not going to do that, make a reference to one of the many FNAF fan games in the Fanverse Initiative, okay? Make them at least slightly canon in the movie universe of the FNAF multiverse. Show us like a Candy's Burgers and Fries paper plate, or like an Ignited Freddy proposition, okay? I mean, you did it in Security Breach, why not make it into the movie? In at 7, Freddy. Feel like this one's kind of obvious, but I have to say it anyway. Freddy was the mascot when the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza opened up in 1983. And in 1987, he and the original animatronics had fallen into severe disrepair. That's when Freddy was replaced with his newer counterpart for the improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. You know, Toy Freddy. After that, Pizzeria closed, as well as the toy animatronics getting scrapped, though they refurbished the old animatronics for the new Pizzeria, which was the old Pizzeria, which is the one that we see in the first game. Yeah. That's FNAF. However, after the closure of that pizzeria, he and the other animatronics got dismantled by William Afton, the killer of the series. But uh, Freddy is literally the title character, okay? Of not only the movie, but the series as well. And while he may not have originally been intended to move off the stage, he does now. He's the most iconic FNAF animatronic ever. He has like 15 variations on his design over the past eight years since the series has been active. So yeah, I want to know, I need, I expect to see Freddy on the big screen. And if he isn't there, I will riot at the local Chuck E. Cheese. And it ain't Fred Bear. With the concept of a Mike screenplay, I think that everything relating to the major events in not just Michael's life, but the Afton's lives as a whole would be essential to see. Especially a moment as life-changing as the Bite of 83. So the Fred Bear animatronic in non-nightmare form is a must in my eyes, but also not very likely, unless it's like a flashback sequence. They're probably not going to worry about the events of the games. But this would probably just be an effort to confirm the main character as Mike and prove that Mike isn't crying child. But also, as an easter egg for fans, that will hopefully have the 1983 date on the flashback. But then again, every 87 believer is going to say that they're different universes, so it doesn't count as confirmation. Either way, I think a Fredbear appearance is kind of mandatory, but I'm not in the movie, so who knows what they think is required. Scott, you should have put me in the movie. How many FNAF videos have I f***ing made at this point? 500? Yeah. God. How are we doing at number five, Springtrap? Springtrap is also kind of a mandatory appearance in my mind because after all, he's the main antagonist of the series. And while the story is about Mike, based on the games, the only version of William that could appear 
is Springtrap. If you think about it, Michael was a teen or close to it in 1983, meaning that by the time the first game comes around in 1993, he would probably be around 23 to 26. But at this point, William was also already Springtrap, since as we're going through the FNAF 3 minigames, we see Mangle walking around, meaning that this takes place around FNAF 2, but shortly after so that the toy animatronics could get scrapped. So unless this takes place while Mike is a teenager, which could make sense given the demographic of the FNAF fandom, the only real version of William that is at least part animatronic since this list is the animatronics we want to see in the movie, would be Springtrap, since Scraptrap doesn't come until Michael's death in FNAF 6, and they wouldn't kill off the protagonist of the movie in the first movie, and Burn Trap doesn't come until after Mike is actually dead. So, yes, the only version of William that has robotic parts that could be in this movie would be Springtrap. Springtrap isn't a full animatronic, but you know what, it's my list. In it for Golden Freddy. Golden Freddy is a mysterious ghost-like entity who takes on the form of the yellow animatronic bear version of normal Freddy. Like I said, he has 15 different versions. He plays a prominent role in the FNAF series, although his origins are cryptic and unknown, but many speculate that Crying Child at least one point possessed the animatronic, which would be an, an easy confirmation to make in a movie about his brother. Or on the other hand, many also believe Golden Freddy to be possessed by Cassidy, and that Cassidy is also the vengeful spirit, aka the one you should not have killed. Although in my research, it's much more likely that Crying Child is the vengeful spirit, and Cassidy is the one who actually possesses Golden Freddy, since it makes for a better story, and in all honesty, okay, Cassidy doesn't really have any significance. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's true. Cassidy is at least less significant than Crying Child. Actually, you know, Cassidy has no meaning to the story at all, all right? The name reveal of Cassidy meant nothing to us. However, confirmation for any explanation or any sequence of events would be much appreciated. So needless to say, it would be great to see them because it means that we might get something to help us figure this out properly. Maybe, unless the movie contradicts itself 10 minutes later, which I'm expecting. Getting close to the end in number three, the puppet. The puppet is an animatronic puppet, obviously. That is a major antagonist, but also a good guy in the FNAF series. First appearing as the main antagonist of FNAF 2, but on later games showing its heroic side, it possibly serves as the prize vendor of the newly refurbished Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria in 1987, the one FNAF 2, which also is a new one, but then also ends up becoming the old one. Although it's implied that it was originally from Fred Bear's Family Diner, and that's a whole other can of worms I am not going to talk about because hell no. After the pizzeria was only open for a few short weeks though, it was closed down. But the puppet, unlike the other toy animatronic who were scrapped, possibly due to malfunctions, was not scrapped. Later appearing in the new pizzeria from the first game as evidenced by the dream cutscenes and appearing as Lefty in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, aka FNAF 6. Lefty was an animatronic intended to capture the puppet because Charlotte's father, Henry, knew that her soul possessed the animatronic. However, it's also widely believed that Charlotte was William's first victim them, meaning that overall they have the most significance to the story. So definitely required if we're going to have a story based on William Afton's crime spree and how it affects his only living child, which is the whole concept for FNAF. So I'm guessing it's gonna happen. But ultimately, in at number two, Foxy. Now while Foxy may be a fan favorite and one of the core animatronics, it's pretty much guaranteed that he'll be in the movie. Although while being in the core cast, there is another reason we need to see Foxy on the silver screen in the Mike story. Foxy bro. See, before we had seemingly confirmed the name of the older brother, since we were flip-flopping between whether Michael was the older brother or crying child's name, the only thing that we knew about the brother was that he enjoyed wearing the foxy mask to scare crying child, seemingly also ripping the head off the stuffed version of the character, possibly due to jealousy. So we ended up nicknaming Michael Foxy Bro, mostly thanks to MatPat's suggestion. So I think that an animatronic that was highly associated with the character of Mike, or who at least we think Mike is, should absolutely be in the movie. And if not, I'm gonna be mad, all right? I wanna see a hook. And finally, in at number one, Nightmares. I think that if this is really meant to be a horror movie, which it, it is, I mean, it's being produced by Blumhouse, after all, the company that made Paranormal Activity, the Nightmares are basically a requirement to actually make this scary. Sorry, but the normal animatronics aren't really all that terrifying. The scariest part about those games is the sounds that appear with the animatronics, but the Nightmares are truly terrifying, and one of the reasons I don't wanna play FNAF 4 or the night terror levels of Help Wanted. It's why I didn't complete the game, because I would have had to play those. Th these things are just absolutely horrific and iconic within the series, especially since they're the reason there is a movie at all. As you well know, at this point, Scott was planning on ending the series after game three, but the hate on the Springtrap jump scare made him make another game, and which was FNAF 4, and then he kept on going. If not for the Nightmare Animatronics and the Springtrap hate, there wouldn't be a FNAF movie, and I think that that deserves to be represented. Of course, in a dream sequence, 
sequence, but still, it's worth it. And it's an Immortal and the Restless. Now, okay, I know that at least the vast majority of the comments in these videos seem to think that this show is like a linchpin in the series that's proving that Afton killed his wife and what her name is, but that's still highly unlikely. The Immortal and the Restless has never popped up again after Sister Location. There has never been another instance of that show having any significance other than just being a show that we watched after we came home from work. It didn't reveal the mother's name, it didn't reveal that Afton never wanted a son, because if he never wanted Crying Child, why would he have tried or sworn to at least put him back together? Or it didn't reveal that Michael and Elizabeth were possessed or literally anything else that we've seen happen in the series. It, it, it didn't prove anything. It wasn't a reference to anything. It was just a purple vampire that was denying a vampire kid. Okay, it just, it doesn't make sense. The Immortal and the Restless shows up less often than the name Jeremy, all right? Plus, the TV you watch doesn't reflect your personal life or your dad's personal life, so I, I just, I basically, I want the show to appear on a TV in one of the scenes. Even if it's in like a window of an electronic store, just have it there so that we know it's just a show. And at nine, Nightmares. The Nightmare Animatronics are the most menacing in the entire series. I mean, they're named the, the Nightmare Animatronics for a reason. But, given the name, they also aren't exactly real, which makes it difficult for these characters to appear in the movie. So, why not just have a dream sequence that includes the Nightmare Animatronics? It's as simple as that. And if you wanted to, you could have it start the movie, which in my opinion would be a hell of an opening. However, uh, I guess at this point, asking them to add scenes is kind of pointless, since they've started production with these specific specific things being greenlit, so I guess this is rather a number hoping that this is something that they had planned on originally, because it's possibly too late now, since most of the time they delete scenes from the final cut rather than add them in, but I don't know, I, I have yet to be cast in something, so I have no idea how that really works. Yeah, I'm not famous enough for the star power, and I am the default character setting for white guy, so oh well. And today, YouTubers. Uh, don't worry, okay, I don't, I don't mean myself, although I would've enjoyed being in the movie, not salty at all. But mostly, I'm just hoping that they make references to the YouTubers that helped make the series successful, okay? I mean, come on. Would you really know about FNAF if it wasn't for Markiplier? Or would you care about the lore if it wasn't for channels like Doco, FNAF, and Super Horror Bro, especially when MatPat is in between theories? Not really. <laughs> and the same is true for a lot of indie games, all right? Minecraft wouldn't be nearly as successful if it wasn't for the first wave of Minecrafters, like Yogg's Cast and the Minecraft SMP. Mod reviews and Shadow of Israfel is what made the game so appealing. And the same is true for the longevity of all games. Skyrim wouldn't be as popular 11 years later without mod reviews and role players. Security Breach got featured next to God of War, for God's sakes pun intended, and like, th that's why the YouTubers who helped assure the series' success should at least be referenced, okay? I mean, come on. Markiplier was in the trailer for FNAF 6, for crying out loud. At least name drop him in the movie. And it's seven games. The in-universe kind specifically, but in my mind those are at times one and the same. I just like some form of reference to the games that Scott's in-universe counterpart designed according to the FNAF VR opening scene. So it could give us a reference, but also like a bit of clarity as to what the games actually are. Like am I right about FNAF 4, 6, and Ultimate Custom Night being games? Or are they like the mini games from Between Nights? Is the, are those the games? What's the deal here? This is part I want the easter egg, but also part I just want an explanation because this could could explain a whole load of things depending on what direction they took with it. But I mean, that's aside the point, really, okay? I, I just want them to talk about the games or make a reference to it or even like suggest if Fazbear Entertainment actually paid Scott to make them or if he did them himself, all right? S to let me know if I should be trusting Tape Girl slash, I guess, assumingly Vanessa at that point. And it's six, Scrap Trap. This is along the lines as well as like wanting a game reference because Scrap Trap is like the most annoying wild card that Scott has ever thrown in. And that's saying something. Like, how do you go from Spring Trap to the exaggerated and cartoonish design of Scrap Trap and then back to Burn Trap, who is too close to Spring Trap for it to make sense? It doesn't. It's certainly weird, but it's also something that they could easily explain in the movie. But, but even if they didn't explain it, even like calling something a Scrap Trap or like a discarded Springlock suit a, a trap of scrap or something, it would be enough to make the fans giggle. But my, my preferred Easter eggs are also explanations because there's so much that we have have to guess about it. That at this point, what we think we know about the series is built off guesses. And even if they're educated guesses that are built on facts that we know, uh, we can't be sure about it unless Scott confirms it. And that's why it's so difficult to figure things out. Scott designed it this way so that he wouldn't be locked into like a story or rules that he set because he didn't set them. We did. 
So make a decision this time, Scott, please, for my own sanity. How are we doing at number five, game theory? Okay, now, I know I said earlier on, like, YouTubers should be referenced like Markiplier, okay? But game theory itself is such a huge influence on the game's success that it deserves its own mention. Okay, something more than, like, the possible FNAF video game cameo montage a la Free Guy, but I think, like, the show of game theory specifically should have its own reference as, like, a crime podcast or an online conspiracy guy who's, like, trying to sort out the mystery of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. I don't know, I think that would be the best way to actually incorporate it and have it make sense uh, or maybe the investigating detectives name is Matthew because that would be funny uh, I just I think that little extra nod to the guy that really made the majority of us aware of the series is definitely deserved if not Required by fans depending on how you feel you might not like him at this point, but uh, come on Hey, okay? I wouldn't have known about FNAF if it wasn't for Matt Pat choosing it over Slenderman because of a poll So yeah, he also said that he didn't have an idea for what the Slenderman theory would have been So I think we can all agree that Matt deserves a reference in the movie Hey, it's better than a comment that you delete eight hours later, Scott, all right? And plus, I want MatPat to notice me. And it for Shaggy. This is purely because I think William Afton making a Scooby-Doo reference would be hilarious, okay? Obviously, I don't think it will happen because it would probably ruin the tone of the movie, but movies or shows referencing an actor's previous work is not a new or unheard of thing. There's entire compilations of series referencing previous movies and shows that their actors starred in, with things like the Arrowverse talking about Victor Garber and the Titanic, or Brandon Ruth returning as Superman. But also, Supernatural had a whole episode where Jared and Jensen played Sam and Dean in a world where Supernatural was a TV show. So they played their characters playing themselves and had to act as those characters acting in an episode as if they were themselves. Themselves. You get me? <laughs> Am I the only one who understood that train of thought? Maybe, but that's fine. Okay, and while those may seem like extreme examples, this is also a series where a serial killer dies and possesses a hard drive that gets scanned into a VR game which lets him then possess another person's brain and control them into bringing his body, which is stuck in a robot suit, back from death. So, it's not really that far out of the question to have Afton say zoinks. Getting close to the end, in number three, Legal Trouble. Fazbear Entertainment has gone through a lot of sh They've had had countless controversies and lawsuits, and most of them are their own doing. I mean, hell, we've made entire lists based on the various OSHA violations that they would have committed. We've made lists about the worst things done by both Afton and Henry, and one of them is supposed to be the good guy. There's even a whole mechanics in FNAF 6 surrounding fighting off lawsuits, which has to have a reason to be there. So, I think showcasing some of these issues, or even like making a mention of some of the problems we've seen, is warranted in the movie. And I hope it comes to pass because this would certainly be an interesting like mini plot or even just like a way to figure out how William skirted these issues and managed to stay out of jail. Come on, you can't tell me you're not the least bit curious about how he was able to not get discovered, especially when his partner was onto him and so suspicious in fact that he upped the security for his daughter. I mean not effectively, but like I've, I've ranted about that previously so I won't go into it again. But ultimately at number two, Fast Bear Frights. No, I'm not talking about the FNAF 3 location. That's Fazbear's Fright, although I understand the confusion. It's basic FNAF. Uh, I'm talking about how I, and I'm pretty sure plenty of you, at least, want references to the various events found throughout the Fazbear Frights books. You know, the ones with like the three stories each about different events happening surrounding the restaurants and characters without really being confirmed or denied as canon. Yeah, those. Like even some minor things that like what happened to the kid who put on Ballora's glasses and danced with me, okay? What about the time traveling ball pit that seems so important and like it would change everything since the game coming out after that had a ball pit in it and then nothing came of it. Yeah, are we gonna see Oscar pop his head out of one in the movie? and then like instantly disappear because that would be an insane reference that would actually make me go nuts in the theater and I just remember that I'm actually going to have to see this I'm not I'm not a f the biggest fan of horror and I mean the last movie I saw for this channel was Sonic so I guess I've done it before. I can do it again. Finally, and a number one, dream theory. Hey, most of you have heard this before. The idea that everything we have seen in these games is a dream. Hey, sure, Help Wanted gets meta and kind of put that theory to bed, and Scott has said no multiple times. But what if all the things that we were seeing are still a dream? What if it's not the crying child in his home or in the hospital who's waking up every morning? What if it's like William Afton dreaming about the insane things he plans on doing and how well it's going to work out for him? Well, I guess t to him it would be working out because he's a lunatic. But, I don't know, time works differently in dreams. You can go a whole month of your life and then wake up and it's only been six hours. And sure, sometimes you're able to control your dreams, but that's difficult to do, at least I think so. Because once you realize you're dreaming, for me anyways, I wake up. 
So, what if he's only like considering killing people right now? And like this is his mind telling him not to do it, or I guess to do it, because again, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Or what if we're still dreaming through Crying Child, and he's like trying to justify the things that he saw, or he played the games and he's having nightmares about them? I don't know, but no matter what, I'd like to see some form of reference to dream theory in the movie, even if we know it's wrong, okay? Like just have someone wake up from a dream, like Wizard of Oz style, but in the sense that they thought it was real and not like that everything was actually a dream. Because if this movie is revealed to be a dream at the end, I'm walking out of the theater. An intense script theme. Back in 2021, there was a whole Reddit post titled Bad News About the FNAF Movie, which plenty of Redditors also decided to report for breaking rule 9 of the FNAF subreddit, uh, that rule being no misleading titles. And technically, they were right, since this was ultimately a joke post by Scott Cawthon, since the bad news was that they, they came up with a script, so they weren't making any more scripts. But again, it, it wasn't removed because, I mean, it, it's Scott. The scrapped scripts included things like the plushies take Manhattan, Silver Eyes, Pawn Shop, Cassidy, and Ghost Trackers, which is basically just the ghost facers from Supernatural but FNAF themed. Uh, but they all had their own issues. Some were too crammed, some had too low stakes, some were just plain old boring, and also apparently a, a lack of coherent story was listed as a problem for one of them, despite that being the whole selling point of the series. But eventually, they settled on a screenplay known as the Mike screenplay, which has the description as, quote, Hmm, this makes sense. Why didn't I think of this before? So, that's what we know. Uh, we, we know that it's probably themed around Mike, but that's it. Also, guys, if you're enjoying the video and want to see more like it, be sure you hit like, alright? It helps us out. The algorithm is, is a pain, so please hit like, juice the numbers. It inflates my ego exponentially, and I, I need it right now. Okay. In a nine production date. Did you know that the FNAF movie first started being discussed in 2015? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's seven years later. After that, the movie aimed to release in 2020, and then in 2021, Scott said that filming would start in spring of this year. And now, in 2022, from the mouth of Jason Blum himself, or I guess technically from his, his fingers because it was on Twitter, we now know that the FNAF movie is supposed to be filming in February of 2023. As to whether that's actually going to happen is honestly questionable, since I mean this is yet another time that we've been told something is going to get filmed, but we won't know if it's true until February of next year, but at least it's something to look forward to for the end of winter, since for some reason, someone decided to put Christmas at the beginning of the coldest and most depressing time in the goddamn world, so maybe instead you can have this be something that we can all look forward to after the snow, at least if you're in this hemisphere. Cause like, once Christmas is over, alright, the snow has no point to be here, okay, and I want it gone, so I'll be using the FNAF filming as, as a way to cope, basically. In a date, original plan. In July of 2015, it was reported that Gil Kennan, the, uh, who's done The Poltergeist and Monster House, had made a deal with Warner Brothers to direct a Five Nights at Freddy's movie adaptation, since, you know, it was a year after the first release and it was immensely popular. In June of 2017, Kennan announced that his adaptation had been cancelled by Warner Brothers and that he was stepping down. And in early 2018, it was announced that Blumhouse Productions was set to make the movie with Chris Columbus, the, the one who worked on Harry Potter, Home Alone, and Mrs. Doubtfire, not the other one, as the director, and the project was aiming for a 2020 release date. But, I mean, at this point, like I said, it's 2022 and they haven't even started filming. So, I think it's fairly safe to say that while we knew the original plan, that's gone out the window. And then it's it's been laying on the I-95 being run over for the better part of two years now. Uh, and in this metaphor, the window was also next to the highway. And it's seven Blumhouse. Like I just mentioned, the current company producing the movie, despite the original director having left, is Blumhouse Productions. Blumhouse is still producing, uh, even though Chris Columbus isn't directing. And honestly, that's probably a good idea in general for Blumhouse, since Blumhouse is known for making incredible productions on smaller budgets, Paranormal Activity being the best example of this. But also, with movies like Get Out, Split, The Purge, Insidious, and more under their belt, Blumhouse was honestly who should have had this movie from the beginning. Especially since I feel like this movie can give off a very, like, Saw vibe with the whole Springlock suits and all that jazz. Like, if the game scenario was made into a movie, instead of this being a separate entity, it would just, it would absolutely end up being a, a very Saw-like scenario. I can imagine, like, the phone guy saying things like, the crank to those Springlocks is inside you, and not in a metaphorical way, it's literally in your leg. And then there's, like, a time 
time for like an hour before the sprinklers come on, which we all know is a bad idea with spring lock suits and stuff. I don't know. I think it would be funny. Uh, that, that would be fun. Someone should do that as a fan film. And it's six, official casting. Uh, there was a lot of rumored casting for the FNAF movie a while back, alright? We even made a whole video about our favorite fan casts. However, about the official casting, alright? There is, there is none. There has been no officially announced casting despite what Google might say. Google, when it brings up a cast list, doesn't actually use the movie, alright? It uses as many sources as it can to find the casting list, as an attempt to make sure it's right. This includes articles from before any official casting was announced though. Meaning that currently, if you search up the FNAF movie cast, you're going to see it as if they have been cast, but this is all from articles, blog posts, and reddit posts and even more talking about what the community wants to see. So despite the fact that Willem Dafoe would make an incredible William Afton in my eyes, uh, it, he hasn't actually been cast, I don't think, or at least officially announced. It's a culmination of the most popular actors that the fans want, at least currently on Google, which I mean maybe Blumhouse should look at before February um, and also cast me in it, please, because that, that would be fun as hell. I want to do that. Halfway through in at number five, Wally's Wonderland. While it's technically not a FNAF movie thing, th this is the kind of thing that I had to include on this list. I mean, come on. This movie starring Nicolas Cage was most definitely meant to be a FNAF movie before the FNAF movie could come out. Quote, A quiet drifter is tricked into a janitorial job at the now condemned Willy's Wonderland. The mundane task suddenly becomes an all-out fight for survival against wave after wave of demonic animatronics. Fists fly, kicks land, titans clash, and only one side will make it out alive. This is basically just the plot to a FNAF fan game, but in a movie form, alright? I even thought that the movie was called Wally's World, which was either lo the location from a, a fan game or it just goes to show how memorable this movie is in comparison to FNAF. So this would honestly be hilarious. Um, if like Wally's Wonderland characters or Willy's whatever it's called ends up actually like in a FNAF game or at some point or like mentioned in the FNAF movie. I don't know. That'd be funny. Hell, maybe this is like the movie that Scott's in FNAF universe counterpart ended up making because of the games he made in universe, you know? Like how Scott gets a FNAF movie in our world, maybe his game version did too. I don't know, I think that'd be hilarious if that's the case. And considering how FNAF is, is kind of leaking into our world, I don't know, it wouldn't be that far of a stretch. And a, and a cameo uh, or reference to like a clear store brand FNAF movie within the actual FNAF movie would be absolutely insane and I would, I would love it. I would pay money just to see that reference. And four theories. We also know that there are tons and tons of theories about the movie, enough to make up at least two lists on this channel. However, we can't really be sure of which ones are correct until the movie releases, but I guess that's kind of the point of theories. Uh, but let's go over some of the current ones, alright? There's a theory that Jack Black will at least make a cameo, considering the viral TikTok of the beloved actor singing the Living Tombstone song. I mean, like, the lyrics he sings are even Five Nights at Freddy's, that's where I wanna be. So. To, to not let him be in Five Nights at Freddy's would just be a sin in my eyes, alright? Theories about the rating of the movie are also up in the air, positing that it could be something closer to rated R, considering how now most fans of the series are above the age of 18. Like, even looking at our statistics on previous FNAF videos, only 10% of the total viewers were between 13 and 17, and the other 90% was 18 and up and the 10% could still be closer to 17 than 13, all right? However, if even Black Adam is gonna end up dropping its rating, I'm pretty sure that for the sake of the brand, the FNAF movie is probably gonna be PG-13 and maybe 14A at most, but most likely PG-13. And what I think is my personal favorite theory, the Scott Cawthon will reprise his role as the phone guy should the role be in the movie theory. I don't know, okay? We don't know much about the script that's being produced, um, but if it does have a phone guy, Hopefully it will most likely be Scott, okay? And hopefully we'll get like a brief shot of him on the phone to get the fans cheering in the theater because we'll all know that it's Scott. So, I don't know, that'd be fun. Getting close to the end in number three, Mike. Based on what we know, thanks to Scott's Reddit post from last year, we know that the Mike screenplay, as Scott called it, is the script that they're actually using for the movie. Or at least, the one that they were going to be using for the movie as of 2021. It, it's been over a year since that post, so things <laughs> might have changed again. But based on what Scott was saying about it, it had all the right characters, all the right motivations, and all the right stakes. So, we can assume that Mike will be in the movie, considering how it's the Mike screenplay, and if he isn't, 
that's kind of an additional misleading script title there, Scott. You're breaking rule nine even more. He also said in that post that filming would start in spring of 2022, and we all know how that went, so I don't know. Uh, if Mike is in the movie, we can also assume that the other Aftons will be present. Um, Elizabeth and Crying Child could have potential to be in there, unless the movie takes place post-1983 bite. Um, but Big Daddy Afton is bound to make an appearance, given that he's the main antagonist of the series and also the, the father of Mike. Um, and I mean Big Daddy because he's the father of what, who is seemingly the main character, not in the other way. So please continue to refrain from sending me Springtrap themed content, please. Um, if you do, I will block you and report. And ultimately, in at number two, Emma Tanny. Jason Blum, while announcing that the movie would be filming in February of 2023, or allegedly at least, he also announced that Emma Tammy will be directing. Emma Tammy is seemingly a little known director, at least to me. I don't think she has anything major on her resume. Most notably, I could see Into the Dark, Fair Chase, The Wind, and the Left Right game under her belt. So, in my mind, this is certainly an interesting choice. But maybe someone that we don't know is who should be directing this movie. Since with someone like Chris Columbus and like Warner Brothers, they would just be worried about setting up another movie and making a successful franchise, whereas Emma will be okay with having a one-off under her belt as long as it does well, and if it does do well, it will look good having a second one on there too. Especially with such a popular franchise and such a famous studio behind her. So needless to say that while some of her work has been subject to criticism before, this is her chance to bring everything back into the positive. And personally, I, I hope that she kills it. No pun intended. And finally, in at number one, real animatronics. Now, originally, when I saw production photos of the team working on the design for the animatronics, I genuinely thought that this movie was going to be stop motion, um, like Tim Burton style, basically. But after Jason Blumhouse announced that the Jim Henson Creature Shop is working on the animatronics, it all kind of clicked in my head. Because that's just kind of how the Jim Henson Creature Shop makes their props and whatnot. That's the process. And if you don't know, these guys are incredible. And they've worked on some insane movies, which also makes them an incredibly cool addition. They've worked on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Jungle Book, Where the Wild Things Are, Batman Begins, and The Muppets, not to mention Sesame Street, Jesse, and a whole lot more. And you know what? Since Debbie Ryan is Bay, I think that the Jesse thing is probably the biggest name drop on that list, alright? Ignore Hitchhikers, ignore Batman Begins, ignore Muppets, Jesse's where it's at. So, yeah, this is gonna be pretty damn sick. Um, so, good job, guys.